We're continuing today in a series of messages looking at the book of Exodus. Today I want to pick up where we left off last time. You might remember last week we talked about how the people of Israel had been rescued from slavery in Egypt. They've seen God work in some unmistakable ways. They know God is with them. And as they come out, God delivers them from the Egyptians, from the Egyptian army. They walk through the lake of reeds on dry ground. And now they're free. And that freedom causes in them a response of celebration and worship and joy. They're thanking God for all that he has done. And that song that they sang is what we saw in the first part of chapter 15. What I want to do today is pick up where we left off. And I want to start with the question, what is it about the wilderness? I want to start with a question today about that song. My question that I want us to consider is, will the song change when the circumstances change? It's really easy to be into the worship, isn't it? You're in the room, and the worship is strong, and the music is good, and everything is right. But, but then your circumstances change. You walk out, and you find that life out there is not the same. It might not be circumstances that you would have chosen, that you would have preferred. Will the song change When the circumstances change. What are we going to see? What are we going to learn from the people of Israel? And that's where I want us to start today. So look with me in chapter 15, starting in verse 22. Then Moses made Israel set out from the Red Sea, and they went into the wilderness of Shur. They went three days in the wilderness and found no water. Now, they're coming out of Egypt. They're coming out from Goshen, right? They come down here. They come across through the Lake of Reeds where God delivers them. And they're in the desert, in the Sinai Peninsula, coming down this western side. It's desert. There is no water. They've gone three days, and there's been no water. That's a pretty big deal when you're talking about 22, 28,000 people plus flocks and herds. You can carry some water with you for a journey, but you can't carry that much. They're going to have to find some water soon. When they came to Marah, they could not drink the water of Marah because it was bitter. Therefore, it was named Marah. Marah in Hebrew means bitter. And the people grumbled against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? Now, some translations have a different word here instead of grumbled. Some translations use the word murmured, murmuring. And I think that's a fantastic word because it sounds like exactly what it is, murmuring. You can't murmur positively. It's a negative-sounding word when you say it. It's very negative when you do it or when you hear it. The people are murmuring against Moses. They're grumbling against him. What is it we're supposed to drink, Moses? You bring us out here to the desert. Where's the water? We're going to all die. What does Moses do? He cries out to the Lord. And the Lord showed him a log, and he threw it into the water, and the water became sweet. There the Lord made for them a statute and a rule, and there he tested them, saying, If you will diligently listen to the voice of the Lord your God, and do that which is right in his eyes, and give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you that I put on the Egyptians." For I am the Lord, your healer. It's so interesting. It's it's like what happened in Egypt, but in reverse. Moses, for one of the yotes, one of the signs that God performed, he made the water of the Nile, the life-giving Nile for the Egyptians, he made that water undrinkable. Here, God uses Moses to make this undrinkable water, this bitter water, drinkable. It's like a reversal. It's an illustration that God is with his people. He has not abandoned them. He has not forsaken them. He is faithful. And God gives them this statute, this rule. And he says, here's what I want you to know. That if you will follow me, if you will do what I tell you, if you will diligently listen to my voice and do that which is right in my eyes, give ear to my commandments, keep all my statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you that I put on the Egyptians. In other words, none of the plagues that you watch them experience will you experience. I will protect you if, if 
you walk in obedience to what I'm telling you. And that's a big if, isn't it? He says, for I am the Lord, your healer. This is who I want to be for you. But you choose. You decide if that's who you're going to be. That element of choice is one we're going to see again and again in the book of Exodus. The people get to choose. It says here that God tested them in this place. Right? He wants to see how they're going to respond to adversity, how they're going to respond to circumstances that were not of their choosing, that were not expected. How will they respond? And they grumbled, they murmured. Not exactly a stellar showing here. Then verse 27, Then they came to Elim, where there were twelve springs of water and seventy palm trees. And they encamped there by the water. Now this is only a handful of miles past Marah. And they get there and there's plenty of water and they're able to camp there for a while. If only they hadn't murmured. God's provision was just around the corner. I look at this section and there's so many things that I see here. You get this idea of 12 and 70. These numbers are significant in Hebrew. They illustrate God's completeness, God's provision, His perfection. God does not abandon His people. That's illustrated even in what they see here at Elim. He doesn't punish them for their murmuring, though. He teaches them. He teaches them something about Himself. He says, if you will do this, then I will do this. He's teaching them what it means to be in a relationship with Him. What does it mean to be His people? What does it mean for Him to be their God? They don't know this. Remember, they have the mindset of having lived in slavery in Egypt for hundreds of years. He's teaching them how to be free, how to make their own choices and be responsible for their own choices. That's what's going on here at Marah and at Elim. The question in their minds is really a pretty simple one. Can God really be trusted with their basic survival needs? They have to have water. You can't go through the desert forever without water. The flocks, the herds, they'll die. The people will die. Can God really be trusted with this? Will He show up? And this is what happens when they first get to Marah and they see the water and they try to drink it and it's bitter. Well, can God really be trusted? Like, here we are, and we have no water, and we're all thirsty. God, do you see? Do you care? Do you know? And we know that He does. What have they seen God do to demonstrate that He sees them, that He cares, that He knows? So many things in these first 15 chapters. But it's so easy to forget. Even when you've seen God do something unmistakable, It's so easy to forget. It's so easy to allow our circumstances to drive our trust. Can God be trusted? Can He be trusted with their basic survival needs? I I love how Victor Hamilton talks about this, an Old Testament scholar. He says, God never half redeems anybody, releasing them from one kind of bondage only to allow them to wallow in another kind of bondage. He will bring the good work He started to completion. This is what we can see on this side, right? But they're in the middle of it, and it's in the middle when you're tempted to doubt, when you're tempted to lose faith and lose trust in your Heavenly Father. That's where they are. Will they trust that God knows what He's doing? Will they trust that Moses is His leader? Will they trust? See, the fact is the people did not have what they expected, And they failed to trust God to provide it. So says Doug Stewart, another Old Testament scholar. The the people didn't have what they'd expected. They expected to come into the desert. God has been providing for them thus far. I don't know how exactly they expected this to look, but it wasn't the bitter water at Marah. Elim, maybe, but they weren't there yet. And so when they're at Marah and they encounter circumstances that are not what they expected, there's the test. What will they do? How will they respond? How do you respond when you encounter circumstances that are not what you expected? 
Is your first response to, to murmur, to complain, to grumble? Or is your first response to say, God, I don't understand, I don't see it yet, but I believe in you, and I know that you know what you're doing, and I'm going to trust that you're going to walk with me through this just as you have been walking with me this whole time. Two options for the people of Israel, two options for you, two options for me. Will we grumble? Will we complain? Will we murmur? Or will we trust based on what God has already done that He has not abandoned us, that He will be faithful? The choice is ours. The choice was theirs. God is clarifying His expectations in this passage. He wants them to know, if you're going to be my people, this is what this is going to look like. If I'm going to be your God, this is what you can expect from me. If you do what I ask, if you follow what I'm teaching you, then I will be the Lord, your healer for you. And you will not have to deal with what you just watched the Egyptians walk through. But if you don't, then I will not be. You will have taken yourself out from under my hand of protection. You will have removed yourself from this relationship of covenant. And you will, be, you will get what you want, which is to be on your own. That's what you think you want. God's trying to teach them a different way. He's clarifying his expectations. He wants them to understand that they can't just sing. They can't just sing when things are good. They have to listen to God and obey Him. They have to do what He tells them to do. And so do we. So do you. And so do I. It's really easy when you're in a worship service and the music is good and things are right to sing and to worship. But you can't just sing when the circumstances are good. You can't just sing, period. We too have to listen to what God says. And we have to walk in obedience to what He asks of us. If we try to just sing and not do that, we're missing it. And that's not the point. And what God's trying to do with the people of Israel, even this, at this point in their journey, so early on, He wants them to understand these circumstances, this wilderness is a testing time for you. This is a time when I want you to learn some things. And I'm going to pour into you. I'm going to invest in you. But I need you to listen. And I need you to trust me. And I need you to do what I say. Can God be trusted with their needs? The answer is yes. And that's not just blind faith. That's based on what God has already done. We've seen for 15 chapters God making provision for His people. God showing up. God hearing and seeing and caring and knowing. And God never changes. He did it then, He'll do it now. For you and I, we can take confidence and faith here. Because if He did it for them, He will do it for you. He was faithful then. He'll be faithful for you. He listened to them and their prayers. He will listen to you. He cared about them. He cares about you. He loved them. He loves you. You have a heavenly Father, just like they did, who wants to be in relationship with you, just like He wanted to be in relationship with them. And one of our proper responses is to sing and to celebrate when we see God doing something that's unmistakable. But it can't just end there. We can't just sing. We have to listen. We have to listen to what He says. And we have to follow His lead. We have to walk in obedience to what He tells us. My hope, my prayer, my challenge for you and for me this week as we walk away from this passage is that we would learn. Sometimes in Scripture we learn from people what to do, and sometimes we learn what not to do. And the words that we speak, and the attitudes that we have in our minds and in our hearts, that's a choice 
We choose our attitude, we choose our words, we choose our actions. I want to learn here not to be a murmurer, a grumbler, a complainer. Because Elim might be just around the corner. God has shown himself to be a God of provision, a God who is faithful. He showed it then. He's shown it to me now. And I can trust him today and tomorrow based on what he has already done. And so can you. Let me pray for us this week that God would bring this to mind when we are tempted to doubt, when we're tempted to look at our circumstances instead of to him. Heavenly Father, sometimes our circumstances can feel like the walls of water that they walked through in the lake of reeds can feel a little overwhelming. Like at any minute, everything can just crash in. But I believe you are the God who provides. You are the God who is faithful. You are the God who loves. I believe that was true then, and I believe it's true now. And I want to pray for each one of us As we walk away from this passage, may this go with us. May we realize the importance of being a people who trust you. Even when the circumstances might look a little grim. That we would remember that you can be trusted and you've proven yourself so many times in the pages of Scripture and in our own lives. May we look to you and not to our circumstances. May we remember you can be trusted. I pray and ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen.